This morning, our New Testament reading can be found in 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 11, verses 23 through 32. And for those of you who have the Pew Bibles, you can find those verses on pages 1784 and 85. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is read. For what I received from the Lord, what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he had broken and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it, in, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread, and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A person ought to examine him or herself before he, he or she eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on him or herself. That is why many of you, or many among you, are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you probably noticed when you looked at our bulletin this morning, this morning is Worldwide Communion Sunday. This event was started in 1933 by a Presbyterian pastor in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The purpose of this special Sunday is to have an event, in this case, the celebration of communion on the first Sunday of October, to be a worldwide demonstration of Christian unity in the midst of our diversity. And one only has to look and try to count how many different denominations we have to determine that, yes, indeed, we have a very diverse body of Christ. I once asked a professor, saying, I've heard 400 denominations, and the professors have looked and said, that's probably a low estimate. To get the full flavor of Paul's instructions in this passage on 1 Corinthians, it would have been helpful to read verses 17 through 22. While we did not read those verses this morning, I will summarize them. Paul is chastising the church in Corinth because of how they were conducting themselves in the quote-unquote celebration of the Lord's Supper. It turned out that when the meal was being celebrated, the wealthy members of the church, who had the advantage of being able to arrange their work schedule however it best fit them, could arrive to the house that was sponsoring the church early in the day, and they would start celebrating the Lord's Supper without waiting for those members of the church who were part of the working class and could not get off early. As a result, by the time the workday was over, those who, have, who arrived early were already drunk, and those who came directly from work 
found that there was nothing left to partake of. One commentator I read put it pretty bluntly. The quote-unquote communion event was turning into just another opportunity for the wealthy to slap the face of the working class people by showing how they had privilege and the working class did not. Obviously, Paul is not going to approve such a practice. He goes so far as to sarcastically ask if those arriving early, do you not have a home to eat your meals in? I love Paul's sarcasm, and that's one of the reasons why Paul is my favorite writer of the uh, New Testament. It sort of gives me the uh, liberty to be sarcastic from time to time, even though my preaching practicum professor said sarcasm is not a spiritual gift. When I, when I told her I disagreed, she looked at me and said, Yes, Steve, we know you disagree because you think it is the most important of all the spiritual gifts. I wish I could say she was wrong, but I don't want to lie. That's the violation of the command not to bear false witness. In verse 23, Paul starts his instruction by declaring that his instructions come directly from the Lord. He is emphasizing that what he is telling the church in Corinth is not something that he designed. It's not something that some other human constructed. But this instruction comes directly from the Lord himself. The apostle reminds his uh, readers that the first Lord's Supper took place on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. That night was during what we call the Passover celebration, and Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room celebrating the Passover feast. When Jews celebrate the Passover, they do not merely see it as being a celebration of an of an, a historical event. Instead, they try to picture themselves as actually being in being a participant in the Passover event in Egypt. I would encourage each one of us this morning to try to picture ourselves as being in the upper room with the disciples as when we partake in the ritual that we call communion. Paul reminds the church that at that meal, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. Those of us who remember the events of Passover will know that the bread that Jesus broke would have been unleavened bread. The unleavened bread reminded the people of Israel that they had to leave Egypt in a hurry, and therefore they did not have time to wait for the bread to rise before baking it. Here, Jesus repurposes the bread. He takes it, he gives things, and just as an aside, I have to imagine just how hard it was for Jesus to know what was going to happen in the next 36 hours and still give thanks. Friends, whenever we are going through tough times, may we be challenged to give thanks and not do what I tend to do. I am, I am one of those that when things go wrong, I have to stop myself from saying, Lord, just one thing? And usually when I say that, he goes, you only want one thing to go right? Then I need to stop having things go right in your life because you've had more than what you're asking for. So let us remember 
even in the midst of troubles, to give thanks for God. But he gave thanks, he broke it, and he then says, this is my body broken for you. In doing that, Jesus is transforming the Passover bread to being a remembrance of what Christ will go through later that night and on the next day. Then he says that when we take the bread, we are to do it in remembrance of him. Likewise, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and declared it to be the cup of the new covenant poured out in his blood. Once again, Jesus is providing a lasting symbol of what will take place the next day on the cross. In Jeremiah 31, God through the prophet is telling the people of Israel there will be a time coming when there will be a new covenant with his people. Here in the Lord's Supper, we see Jesus with the cup saying, the time of the new covenant that Jeremiah foretold is taking place in front of the disciples' own eyes. The blood was important for two reasons. First of all, the shedding of the blood was necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. Christ's death on the cross was the shedding of the blood that enables us to be forgiven and have a right relationship with God the Father. The other importance of the blood was that in biblical times, covenants were often sealed by the shedding of the blood. Jesus is declaring that his blood was sufficient for the forgiving of our sins, and it was the blood that sealed the covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about. Those of us who have studied the theology of, the, of Holy Communion, or perhaps if you just attended worship in another denomination, may be aware that there are many different uh, denominations that have different views about what the bread and the cup are. For example, our friends worshiping across the street in the Catholic Church, along with the Episcopal brother, our Episcopal brothers and sisters, declare that when the priest says the words of institution, the bread and the cup somehow magically change from being bread and wine to being the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. The Lutherans don't quite go as far as our Catholic and Episcopal friends, but they do see that the body of Christ is wrapped around the elements of the bread and the cup. Those in the Calvinist tradition, which includes the Presbyterian and the Methodist Church, affirm that the bread and the wine, or in our case, grape juice, do not change their nature, but that Christ is spiritually present in the elements. Finally, a last major way of looking at the elements is taken from the lead of a 16th century theologian named Holdrich Zingli. He argues that nothing special happens to the elements at all. The bread and the cup are merely symbols meant to remind us of the events of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Personally, I reject the Catholic view as being flat out inconceivable. However, I do not have a strong opinion about the other views. I would argue whichever way you want to view the elements, 
the important point is that we recognize the importance of the communion celebration. Whether we take the Lutheran, the Calvinistic, or the Zwinglian view of the elements is not important. Instead, let us remember when we come to the Lord's table, we are coming in remembrance of Christ's sacrificial love for us. After reviewing the events of the first Lord's Supper, Paul then adds his own commentary in verse 26, which I chose to be our memory verse for the week. He declares that as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In making that statement, Paul is not is saying more than just that we need to look back and see what happened in the past. Paul says we need to also look forward to the future when Christ will return in glory. In the next paragraph, Paul goes on to explain why this ritual needs to be celebrated with great care. He declares that anyone who participates in eating of the bread and drinking of the cup in a manner that is unworthy is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. It is because of verse 27 that some denominations ban anyone who is not a member of their church or their denomination from partaking in the Eucharist, which is what many of those churches call communion. They want to protect the sanctity of the sacrament, and therefore they limit the bread and the cup to only those who have gone through their catechism and whom they know will be taking the communion in a manner that that denomination <coughs> determines to be worthy. Verse 27 does raise an important question. What constitutes celebrating in a worthy manner? Paul answers that question in verse 29 by defining what an unworthy manner is. He declares that those who do not recognize the body of the Lord in the elements eats and drinks judgment on themselves. In light of what Paul says in this verse, our denomination in our Book of Order declares, and I'll be quoting here, the opportunity to eat and drink with Christ is not a right bestowed on the worthy, and I'll just add a parenthetical comment, if only the worthy could participate, there's no need to have any bread or any wine because none of us are worthy. But instead is a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. As I will proclaim during our communion service, all who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are invited to come to the table of the Lord. Backing up to verse 28, Paul gives more instruction on what we should do to ensure that we are partaking in the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. We ought to examine ourselves. This examination should bring to mind those sins that we need to confess and repent from. Paul continues that thought in verse 31 when he declares that when we rightly judge ourselves, we do not come under judgment. The next verse continues by saying, when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. 
in telling us that we need to examine ourselves, we should see that the Lord's Supper should not remind us of just what happened in the past, and it should not just remind us to look forward to the future, but it should also remind us to examine ourselves to see what our lives are like today. I like seeing Paul's instructions to examine ourselves to be similar to what I sometimes had to tell some of my high achieving students when I was a teacher. Occasionally, I would have a student who was upset if he or she did not get 100% on a homework assignment. Each homework assignment in my uh, grading system was about 1%, and that was if I did not issue too many homework assignments. Often it would be point something percent of the total grade. I would tell the student that I understood that they did not like the feeling of having one or maybe two wrong answers on this assignment. I would then follow that statement up by telling the student that the key isn't trying to get 100% on the homework assignment, but to learn from their mistake and get it right on the upcoming test which would be worth about 25% of their grade. Paul is saying something similar here. While we might not enjoy when the Lord disciplines us here on earth, if we learn from that discipline, repent from our mistakes, and confess them, when it comes time for the ultimate final exam, known as Judgment Day, we will pass that one with flying colors. I'm willing to take a B or a C on homework assignments in order to pass uh, the final exam. As we come to the Lord's table in a few moments, let us allow that table to remind us what Jesus did for us on the night that he was betrayed. Let us also be pointed to the glorious future that lies ahead as we anticipate his return. Finally, let it also be a call for us to examine ourselves, confess and repent from our sins that we discover during this examination. If we take these steps, we will indeed partake in this celebration of communion in a manner that is worthy. Amen. Amen.